I have come to believe that my time on earth that is left to me shall no longer be measured by years or months or weeks, but in days, perhaps in hours. At this fragile stage in a man's life, when breathing is laborious and eyelids become heavy, he hopes that he will leave something of worth behind him that he may be well remembered. I know that I will not be well remembered, but I will leave something behind that may be of help to whoever finds it. Whoever opens this chest will find my compositions of sacred musical pieces. These songs have always been of great value to me. I always believed that this music might serve a divine purpose, but alas, I was not able to witness this in my lifetime. Do as you please, but it is my hope that this music will one day fall into the hands of someone who might find a use for it, a use for the music that was found to be so unacceptable in my lifetime. Grover T. Solomon. So I am here right now talking with my new friend, Lorena, from out in Texas. So how's it going out there, Lorena? Hi, Michael. So for everybody who's watching right now, this is actually the second time that Lorena and I have had a chance to talk. And for the life of me, I wish that I would have thought to record the first conversation, but I didn't. I didn't really know what uh, all this was going to turn into uh, the first time we talked. So from here on out, I'm recording everybody that I talked to about this. Uh, um, Lorena, you're a descendant of an American hymn writer, writer of sacred music by the name of Grover Solomon. Um, and uh, he was writing music at the, at the beginning or the early part of the 1800s, yeah? That's right, Michael. The first piece that he wrote was dated 1809. So uh, before we go any further into this conversation, um, I have to ask you a question that has been on my mind since our last conversation. Uh, go ahead. What kind of a name is Grover? Nolan Livesey. <laughs> how, are, how are you? Hey, Mike. I'm good. How are you All doing? Right. So um, this is my friend. Nolan Livesey, he is a graduate from the very prestigious Azusa Pacific University music program. Now, are you like the most famous person that's ever graduated from their music program? Oh, uh, I don't know. I'm not famous. I'm not famous. There was a, a, a famous um, Olympic athlete that graduated from APU, although he was not in the music department. But <laughs> yeah, but, but you've, you've written for television and movies and performed on Broadway. And uh, so... I, I don't know, you're, you're famous to me. You're, you're probably what I would consider to be quite the expert in music. Yeah, I mean, I'm a professional musician. That's what I do. I've done a lot of things with composing and, and performing and sure. All right. But at any rate, there is a really, a really a very interesting story about uh, Grover's music. Uh, could you tell us how you happen to come into contact with this music? Yeah, sure. Um, Grover was my great, great grandfather on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. My mom's father was a preacher in Kentucky, in Kentucky and he pastored his congregation right up until the, the day he died. Um, mm -hmm. He lived in the parsonage right there on the church property. All right, well, um, did you have a chance to look over the music that I sent you? Yes, it was very interesting. It's really cool to kind of look back in time and look, see the way things look especially handwritten sheet music, like, you know, you can look at sketches from Mozart and Beethoven, and this was really interesting. It's very so, different. Um, I, I actually scanned the music and sent it over to Nolan, but he doesn't know any of the backstory. All that he's seen is the music. And um, I wanted to do that so that I could ask you what, if anything, you might be able to tell me about the music or maybe even the songwriter from just looking at his uh, work. Um, what what kind of a church was that? It was a little Baptist church, and it sat Baptist. right in the middle of a Kentucky cornfield. If you can oh, believe yeah. that, of course, of course, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and toward the end of my granddad's life, there were maybe 
only 20 people who were still attending the church. And when he passed away, the congregation just sort of scattered and they all went to different churches. So when no one took over as pastor of the church, it just started to deteriorate. It well, sat yeah, empty for so long. That's a, that's a bad thing. You just described, that's a perfect uh, Baptist congregation you just described. I mean, just like <laughs> it the, is, the, isn't it? I mean, just yeah, just what you said. That's like that. You know, you got the faithful, the really faithful, like twenty some people that go to the the church in the cornfield. They never leave the church. It's the same pastor, and then um, this, you know, they stay right up until the end. You know, I I live in rural Texas today, and and um, it's very much the same. There are lots of of small little churches around, and mm -hmm. when the pastor passes away at those churches. The, the church just starts to, to die at some point. So um, that's what happened here. It, it was literally rotting away and, and the walls were falling apart. Um, so someone made the decision to go in and tear it down. So my parents were blessed to have the opportunity to get to go back to the church one last time and um, take any of the uh, remaining mementos that they wanted. So, so my parents had actually cleaned out my granddad's study many years before. Um, the only thing that they took from the church were the things um, from his office. And she kept the doorknob from my granddad's office, which, which was, was very emotional for her. She had spent so much time there as a child and she grew up watching her father preach and she would play in the church um, while he was putting his sermons together. And, you know, this was just a huge part of her life and, and the, the last physical link to her father and it was about to be gone. Um, my dad was helping my mom clean out and get, get the last few things that they wanted. And he had gone down into the basement and it was a complete mess. Anyway, he came across some old hymnals and most of them were falling apart. Um, but behind one stack of hymnals, there was an old chest and they didn't even think anything of, about it. They just picked it up and, and put it in the car. They had no idea what it was until they got home and they cut the lock off of it. And when they opened it, it contained the life's work of my great great grandfather. So your parents found the music, and now you have it. Well, from what I can tell, it looks like it looks very untrained. It looks like some sort of um, shorthand, to where obviously he knew what it meant, or she is this was this a man or a woman? You no, know, it was a man. The man. Yeah. So he obviously knew um, what it meant. And it was very hurried. It looks very hurried. Like some of the line, like the uh, manuscript lines were drawn like himself. And it's, it just doesn't even make sense a lot of the time. It's not something that you could just hand over to other professionals and they would understand it. It was obviously something that like to keep track in his mind, like when you wake up from a dream and it starts to fade or something and you want to get it down as quickly as you can. That's kind of look, looked to me untrained and hurried and obviously some sort of shorthand. And it looks like there was some weird, modulations or key changes that wouldn't have been you know if it's like a sacred song or a sacred work that would have been really bold to to do that back then because what, what if just, i what if i told you the year that it was written in was 1809 whoa okay that's yeah that would have been really bold what i'm wondering is when i'm looking at the the music that you sent me the lyrics are fantastic um the music it really does seem to be rather catchy um, with, with everything that I've played so far. And it looked like he had written a, a lot of music. And it means we've got a, a huge body of work there. Um, what I'm wondering is, why have I never heard of Grover Solomon before? Uh, well, sadly, um, it's because the church believed that he had made some very poor choices in his life. And he had basically been disgraced. Um, no one would print his music, and the few places that did removed them from, from any later editions. So, you know, very few people had ever even heard his music or and even can, knew who he was. 
could, that's um because liturgical or sacred music back then it was it just wasn't like that you couldn't do anything uh, you know it was very rigid and they would you know if you used like the tritone for example the interval of a tritone which is very common now they would say it's you know that that's the devil's interval and you know they would say that it's like satan worship to use that why what, what, like what, that. Is, what, is, what does that matter like what does that matter if uh, you use a tritone in music i don't remember the actual reason why that in particular but they they just wanted to keep things I guess it was some sort of a legalistic way of looking at things, even musically speaking. I, I don't remember, but but yeah, if you were to do that, they would, you know, they, they just, it wasn't acceptable. I think there were people that were like even excommunicated or shunned over over musical reasons but, like that, which seems but, insane, but. Well, yeah, I mean, you can look at the lyrics for it and it clearly is a sacred song, lyrically yeah. that's pointing people to God. Now, looking at the lyrics, they wouldn't, would they really think that the person's in league with the devil? They might. I mean, I that that's what I heard in music history class. Is that is that, you know, it seems insane now, but but yeah, even if the the, the lyrics were good and sacred. But, but by today's standards, not, today's standards, you can do stuff like that, right? Oh sure, but you know, if this was, you know, two hundred years ago, that you know, you can do that now, but you couldn't do that then. Even if the lyrics were good, if the music was not, they could say like, oh, he's in league with the devil. He's trying to confuse people. There's some truth in there, but he's bringing the truth down with with the falsehood of the tritone or whatever it might, you know, whatever the case may be that they don't like. <laughs> the falsehood of the tritone. Yeah. And Kentucky is sitting right there, right, right in the Bible belt. <laughs> yep, that's right. And, you know, it was such a conservative time the church was always upset with him for something. They certainly didn't care for the style of music he was writing. I, you know what, though, this isn't even surprising because I know that just like 20 years ago, I remember sitting in a Baptist church and the, oh, drum, yeah. set, the drum set was introduced for the first time onto the worship team. <laughs> and I literally thought people were going to lose it. There were some people when they just walked in the building and saw it sitting in there and they turned around and walked out. And I heard somebody I, I promise you this is true. Somebody said um, they were worried that if the drummer hit a right pattern on the drum set that the, it would summon the, the devil. And, and that was what, just 20 years ago? Imagine 200 years ago, if you, if you keep that pattern going all the way back that far. <laughs> this is a strong word, but he was basically condemned. And it crushed him and it embarrassed the entire family at the time. So do you think that maybe that's that's why your your own grandpa kept his music just kind of in, locked away in a chest in the church basement? Yeah, absolutely. My granddad was a very strict man. And while I'm sure that he recognized the music as an heirloom of sorts, I believe he didn't want anything to do with it. And I it was during the summer of 1809 when it was proclaimed that a meeting would be held under the tents. The sinners would gather and hear the message of salvation preached. Now half of the sinners were sure to come forward at the end of the message while the other half of the sinners were sure to sneak away and head off towards the taverns. But then half of the half of the sinners who came forward would find their friends in the taverns later that evening. I had written a song which I hoped might be sung during that meeting under the tent. I tried to present it to our reverend of our church, but he refused to hear it. Said that they had a bona fide professional singer coming all the way from New York and that she would bless us with songs appropriated by the church. Well, that singer from New York never did show up. In desperation, they asked my mother to sing. As a result, my song ended up being sung after all. As my mother sang, the sinners came forward in droves and dedicated their lives, or rededicated their lives, or even re-re-rededicated their lives. My mother continued to sing until her voice hurt. She began the evening with the voice of an angel and ended with the voice of a frog. That is a night I will remember 
until my dying day. The piece that you're going to um, play, it's called His Blood Covers It All. It's dated 1809. Mm -hmm. He left a journal in that, in that chest that told the story of most of the songs that he had written. And this particular song was written um, for a tent revival in Kentucky. So um, tell everybody how old he was when he wrote this one. He was 17 years old. Well, what yeah. if I told you that the songwriter was uh, 17? The composer was 17 when he wrote the lyrics and music to this. Okay, no, that would actually explain a lot. I think that would explain a lot. Well, what, what does it explain? Like, um, well, like the penmanship, for example, if he was untrained, maybe he was trained later on in life. You can tell that how the, um, the shorthand nature of it, um, and also it's just how sloppy it is. I mean, the penmanship was, was clearly bad. So, you know, a lot of people at 17, I mean, I still have bad penmanship, but you know, that could, that could definitely be an explanation as to why it's so sloppy and it's um, scatterbrained, you know, very hurried and scatterbrained. Well, what, what about the what about the actual composition itself? Well, you know, it's hard to make out clearly. What, like I have a hard time fully understanding it, um, but it looks interesting. It looks like this guy had real talent. You know, it looks like he had a good understanding of tonality and shifting tonality to to even experiment with it that far at that point. And so, here we have the very first composition that we know of written by Grover Solomon at the age of 17. His blood covers it all. Helpless by our own defense, unable to atone, someone must pay the price for the life of the sin we own. Closer with each hour comes the judgment day. Don't wait another minute, friend. Fall to your knees and pray. His blood covers it all. There's no trespass too big or too small. No sin built a wall. No matter how tall it will fall when we call on the Lord. Living just for worldly wealth, a choice we'll all regret. Let's walk the straight and the narrow path with eyes on heaven set. Though we stumble often, still our garments white. Leaving darkness with each step, we're taking towards the light. Place yourself in the key of the good shepherd guiding his sheep. The valleys are deep and mountains are steep. You will leap as you reap your reward. Go tell the ones you know of God. Seek out the stranger too. The harvest time is drawing near. There is work we must do. Closer, closer to the Lord will grow each passing day. We'll meditate upon His Word and fall to our knees and pray. His blood covers it all. There's no trespass too big or too small. No sin built the wall. No matter how tall it will fall when we call on the Lord. No sin built a wall. No matter how tall it will fall when we call on the Lord. So uh, right now, we get to introduce the music of Grover Solomon to anybody who might enjoy it. Oh, wow. I 100% believe that it was meant to happen. I believe that my great-great-grandfather's music stayed locked away until now for a reason, until the time was right. <laughs>